Contender, ready! Gladiator, ready! Three, two, one! Let's go! Thank you so much for joining me today as we continue our Bodyguard series and what? an awesome show the gladiators is uh, kind of kicked off in the 90s in my childhood i loved watching it on telly seeing the duel with the big pugil sticks trying to knock each other off looking at them climbing up the wall thinking i reckon i could do that and then running the wrong way up an escalator in the shopping center imagining that you are on the travelator charging to victory Ah, happy days. Ah, dum, dum, dum. Another one bites the dust. Anyway, let's crack on. So we're thinking about this passage at the end of Ephesians where Paul gives us some final words and he, he alludes, he gives us this idea that we're in a spiritual battle, that there are some forces and an enemy that somehow we are engaged with in a wrestle, in a battle, and he's telling us to stand strong. Now, this isn't necessarily my favorite subject. As, as Johnny said last time, sometimes this gets a little bit weird or we can get a little bit afraid or fearful, or sometimes churches and Christians just do bizarre and some like downright dangerous things when it comes to spiritual warfare. But Paul talks about it. It's a reality that he calls us to confront. And so we need to try and find a way through this and learn the lessons that Paul is calling us to. Predominantly today, I want us to think about the shield of faith, but we're gonna do quite a few detours before we get there. Whose armor are we wearing Anyway, what's the nature of the fight? What does standing and schemes mean? But to help anchor us, I'm gonna give us through two triplets. So the first one is this fear, frustration, and the flesh. Fear, frustration, and the flesh. Uh, I think when it comes to spiritual warfare, our, our enemy's objective is to get us to move out of fear, out of frustration, or out of a flesh moment. The other triplet I want us to think about starts with S. It's the shield, it's standing, and it's schemes. The shield, standing, and schemes. Ephesians 6.10, Paul says, put on the whole armour of God so that you may stand against the schemes of the devil. Now, Johnny gave us a triplet last week, last time, didn't he? He said that often we find ourselves fighting against our, ourselves. Sometimes the battle's actually not with anybody else. It's just trying to get ourselves to do the things that we want to do and that we know are right to do. Sometimes the battle is just with this fallen world that we live in. Life just keeps coming at us. Things don't work out the way they should. We're living in a broken world amongst broken people. And so things just aren't always easy. And then thirdly, we do have a spiritual enemy that is trying to do something against us. I... I like this word schemes of the devil. Strange thing to say, let me tell you why I quite like it. Paul puts two Greek words together when he says the schemes and it, it's got this idea of trickery, of cunning, of deceit. Imagine this, imagine you're holding a precious jewel and I want that precious jewel. Now, if I have a legal right to that jewel, I can walk up to you and go, give me the diamond or you'll hear from my lawyers or I'll get the police. There, there are legal avenues that I can pursue to get that jewel from you to me. But what if you hold the legal rights to it? What if actually it's yours and it's not mine and I have no right to it? I can't demand it or, or pursue legal means to it. So what else might I do? Well, I might punch you in the face. 
I might come and attack you. I might overpower you and wrestle it out of your hand. But what if you're stronger than me? What if I don't have the power to overpower you? What if actually if I punched you in the face, you pick me up and throw me across the room? See, if I don't have the legal right to pursue it, if I don't have the strength to overpower you, well, I've only got one option left. I've got to try and scheme. I've got to try and trick you. I've got to somehow work and concoct a plan to get it out of your hands, to get you to somehow give it to me or be careless and leave it somewhere so that I can get it. You see, our enemy has no legal right against us. He can't move us from the ground that we're on, nor can he remove the blessings that God has given to us because they're not legally his, they're ours. He's also defeated. He does not have the strength to overpower us and take what is ours in Christ. So the only option he's got left is to scheme, is to try and trick us to drop our shield, to move from the ground that we are in, to give up the blessings that we have. If he had the strength, he'd overpower us. If he had the right, he could take it, but he doesn't. And so our battle is against someone who is scheming to try and get us to make a false move. That's why last time Johnny talked about the battle is a defensive battle. Jesus has already won the victory. We already have every blessing in Christ Jesus. It's already ours and our job is to stand in what we have and not get tricked into giving it away. To not move into fear, frustration or faith, but to stand. Whatever the schemes the enemy might throw at us, whatever tricks he might try and deploy, if we can stand, then we are in the victory. Standing's quite boring though, isn't it? Have you ever been to a theme park where there's a ride that you're really keen to go on and, and you're standing in the queue, sometimes for hours on end, it gets really boring. But if you stand, if you remain in the queue, you will get your place on the ride. The only thing that can go wrong is if you get distracted and wander off. It's already been paid for. You have your place. You've just got to remain standing. So the enemy is trying to scheme because he doesn't have the strength or the right to take anything from us. So he's trying to scheme to get us to make a false move and move out of the position that we're standing in. But then we have a shield. Well, in fact, we have more than a shield. We have the armour of God. Now, come with me on a little diversion, because although I want to land back on the shield, let's think about some of the other elements of the armour, because my question is, whose armour are we standing in? Well, it's the, it's the armour of God, right? But I think we can take that literally. I think it's literally the armour that God wore. So often when we approach this passage, because we know Paul is in prison, because we know Paul has grown up and lived in a culture where the Roman army are surrounding him and ever present. Uh, at times, the Romans rescue him from the riots, whilst at the same time arresting him and imprisoning him. He's very familiar with what a Roman soldier would look like. And so we often think that when Paul describes the armour of God, he's describing the armour that a Roman soldier might wear. Now, when it comes to the shield, he is. The word he uses denotes a long oblong shield like the Romans would use, not a small round shield like maybe more the Greeks would have used. But when he's talking about the other bits of armour, I don't think he's talking about a Roman soldier. I think he's talking about another one. Come with me to Isaiah 59, verse 15 to 20. Isaiah says this, the Lord looked 
and was displeased to find there was no justice. He was amazed to see that no one intervened to help the oppressed. So he himself stepped in to save them with his strong arm and his justice sustained them. He put on righteousness as his body armour and placed the helmet of salvation on his head. He clothed himself with a robe of vengeance and wrapped himself in a cloak of divine passion. He will repay his enemies for the evil deeds. His fury will fall on his foes. He will pay them back even to the ends of the earth. In the West, people will respect the name of the Lord. In the East, they will glorify him. For he will come like a raging flood tide, driven by the breath of the Lord. The Redeemer will come to Jerusalem to buy back those in Israel who have turned from their sins. So Paul is talking about the fact that that God looked from heaven and he saw that his creation was caught in sin, mired in the schemes of their enemy, under the influence of evil. And he looked and he was amazed, nobody's doing anything about this. And so he puts on his helmet of salvation. He puts on his breastplate of righteousness. He clothes himself in a cloak of passionate fury. And he comes in to rescue humanity. I love this picture. It makes me think of a bit like a a mama bear. You know, when you play with mama bear's cubs and she comes out swinging at you. You you get this sense in Isaiah that there's this warrior king who's charging in to rescue and buy us back from the chaos that we've got ourselves into. He says, those who repent, those who have turned from their sins will be rescued and brought back by the warrior king. When Paul says the helmet of salvation, when he says the breastplate of righteousness, I don't think he's thinking about the Roman soldier outside of his cell. I think he's thinking about the warrior king that Isaiah said would come and rescue his people. What if the helmet of salvation was the very helmet Jesus wore when he died on the cross for you? What if the breastplate of righteousness was the very breastplate that he had on when he raised from the dead and made us right with God? I think Paul is is trying to get his readers to understand not only are you standing in a place of victory, but you're wearing the very armour that our warrior king wore when he defeated the enemy. So, That's why he's calling us to stand. He's saying, listen, you've been rescued from sin. Don't rush back into the flesh because you're wearing the armour that your king wore when he saved you. Imagine this. Imagine you're in a in a building fire and you're trapped and you can't get yourself out and you're wondering what on earth is going to happen. And then suddenly through the flames and the smoke and the heat and the chaos and the terror, a firefighter comes and they scoop you up and they carry you out of the building. And as they get you out of the building, they take off their helmet and put it on your head. They take off their jacket and they put it round you to let you know that you are safe and you are protected and this fire isn't going to touch you anymore. Would you then get up and run straight back into that building? Oh, I'm protected now. Woohoo! Of course you wouldn't. And yet what the enemy wants to do is get you to step back into your flesh, to return to the sins that you've been set free from, to to give in to the temptations that you have been rescued from. And Paul is trying to say, don't we understand? Not only are we standing in the ground of victory, but we're wearing the very armour our hero was wearing. Don't step back into the flesh. Stand in the salvation and the righteousness that has been won. Paul talks about putting on the, 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 the shoes of the peace of the good news, the readiness that comes 
with the gospel, the peace that comes with the gospel. Again, I think he's maybe thinking about something in Isaiah. Isaiah 52, 7, how beautiful on the mountains are the feet of the messenger who brings good news. The good news of peace and salvation. The news that the God of Israel reigns. Beautiful feet. I don't really think feet are beautiful, to be honest. I don't really understand people who've got a foot fetish. I think it's just a bit weird, really, isn't it? But hey, each to their own. That's if that's you, you knock yourself out. But, you know, feet, they're not normally things that we call beautiful. But Isaiah is painting us this picture of a watchman who's looking out over the city and he's looking out around the surrounding areas. What's coming at us? If a messenger is coming do they look anxious? Are they running in fear? Are they bringing bad news? Or actually, how brilliant is it to see somebody coming with good news? Somebody coming to tell us, ah, oh, God reigns. We are at peace. There is nothing to fear. We've thought about stepping back into the flesh. But, you know, the enemy will try and get us to move out of frustration or fear. Sometimes we have anxious feet. As part of our train and develop focus, uh, you might be aware at Solihull, we've been been, uh, coaching some new speakers in our evening gathering. And one of the things that we all do when we first start public speaking is we pace up and down because we're nervous and we're anxious and we're not quite too sure how this is going to go. And so when we're anxious, our feet start moving and we kind of find ourselves pacing around. And one of the things that we always say to new speakers is plant your feet. Don't move out of anxiety. Don't move out of fear. Don't move out of frustration. One of the hardest things for us as we mature as Christians is to only move when we've got peace. Because so often we make a decision out of frustration. We take an action out of fear. If I don't do this, something bad will happen. Or, oh, I deserve this, so I'm gonna make this happen for myself. Or I'm so fed up that I'm just gonna do something to blow this circumstance up. And that's one of the schemes of the enemy is to get you to move out of fear or frustration. And yet Paul is saying, your feet, when they move, they're moving because they're in peace. The situation can be raging around you, but if you're making a decision, if you're taking a step, if you're making a move, you're doing it because the peace of God is guarding your heart and his peace is leading you. Paul is saying you've got the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness that Jesus wore when he died for you. So don't run back into sin. Stand in the righteousness that you've been given. On your feet is the peace that comes with knowing that God is for you. So don't move out of fear or frustration. Just stand firm in the ground you've been given. And if you move, it's because the peace of God is leading you forwards. We get another glimpse of this warrior king in Isaiah. Uh, Isaiah 11 and Isaiah 49. Isaiah 11. Out of the stump of David's family will grow a shoot, yes a new branch bearing fruit from the old root, and the spirit of the Lord will rest on him. The spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge of the fear of the Lord. He will delight in obeying the Lord. He will not judge by appearance nor make a decision based on hearsay. He will give justice to the poor and make fair decisions for the exploited. The earth will shake at the force of his word and one breath from his mouth will destroy the wicked. He will wear righteousness like a belt and truth like an undergarment. This idea again of this warrior king who is going to come and bring justice and freedom and his words are sharp. 
that they're like a sword when he speaks. They cut down the wickedness. And, and he's, he's held together around his waist, tying everything in. Is the righteousness and truth that he stands for. You get this again in Isaiah 49. Listen to me, all you distant lands. Pay attention, you who are far away. The Lord called me before my birth. From the womb he called me by name. He made my words of judgment as sharp as a sword. He has hidden me in the shadow of his hand. I am like a sharp arrow in his quiver. Again, in these two passages, we, we get this idea of a belt of truth holding everything together and a sword that is sharp, that is the words that this warrior king will speak. Paul is saying, stand in the truth. Truth will hold everything together. But if you end up standing in lies, if you end up being deceived into who you are in Christ or not really fully understanding everything that he's done for you, if you're not saturated in the word and everything that Paul's been trying to get you to see in Ephesians, then you're building like a pack of cards and everything will fall down and your backside will be exposed. But truth. The truth will hold everything together. And you know, when we pray, when we engage in this spiritual wrestle, it's the word of God that we need to pray. You know, we can feel frustrated, but you, we can pray the word of God. Thank you, Jesus. I have every spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus. We, we can be afraid and we can pray, Lord, thank you that your perfect love casts out fear. We can be tempted in the flesh and we can pray, Lord, help me to understand today that I have been crucified with Christ. My, my fleshly temptations and desires don't need to overpower me because actually they are dead on the cross. And I am now a new creation. The words of God are a sharp sword to help us in our fight. I want us just in conclusion to come back to the shield. So the enemy can't legally take anything from you. He, he can't physically, spiritually strong. He doesn't have the strength to overpower you. So the only thing left for him to do is to try and trick you to, to moving into the flesh, into fear, into frustration. And Paul says, remember the ground you're standing on and remember whose armour you are wearing. Don't give in to his scheming. But the shield doesn't appear in Isaiah. Every other item of the armour of God is in Isaiah, but the shield isn't. I wonder if this is why Paul says in verse 16, in addition to all of these, hold up the shield of faith to stop the fiery arrows of the devil. I think my best guess, I think Paul's leaning into all the Isaiah scriptures about the warrior king, and then he's saying, hey, our warrior king didn't need a shield because he wasn't on the defensive. He was on the absolute attack. But now we're holding the ground that he's won. I'm gonna add a shield into this. And I guess if you're the Apostle Paul, you can add things to Isaiah. That's kind of part of your, your gig. And he talks about this Roman shield that the Romans would stand behind and all lock in together. And the enemy would try and pelt things through the air. They would try and pelt stones. They would try and pelt arrows. They would try and pelt fiery projectiles. And all the Roman soldiers had to do was lock in and keep the shield you know, every battle starts in the air, be it the ancient battles of, of uh, history where archers would throw things or fast soldiers would run out ahead of the lines like David, whip their stones across and then leg it back. Uh, be it the, the military bombardments, the artillery bombardments that happened in World War I before the soldiers went over the top, or even in modern warfare, be it a pilot in a room maybe a little bit like this, flying a drone that's somewhere else around the world and dropping 
uh, explosives onto areas before boots hit the ground, things fly through the air. I think that's the battle that we are facing because the enemy knows his boots actually can't get close to our ground. So all he can do is fire things at us to try and get us to move. And all we have to do is stay in faith. Stay with complete trust in every circumstance that God is working. He is working for our good and he will bring us to victory. Don't drop your shield in fear, in frustration or in the flesh. Remember where you stand. Remember whose armour you are standing in and in every circumstance. Hold up your faith. God is my refuge and strength. He will not let me be moved. Hello, my name's Naomi. It's been great to have you with us for our message here at Renewal. If you want to find out more about what it means to follow Jesus, you can visit renewalcc.com forward slash next steps and you'll be sent a few videos which might answer some of those bigger questions that you might have. Likewise, maybe you just want to say hello to the team. So you can email hello at renewalcc.com. And then if you're really enjoying all of these videos, what you can do is click the subscribe button, which is the wonderful red button that you cannot miss on your screen to be notified of any other videos that come in. You can also listen to our messages on the go. So if you visit renewalcc.com forward slash media, you'll be able to see podcasts and then that will also link you to the YouTube channel. But maybe actually you just want to support the work that Renewal is doing. And you can do that by visiting renewalcc.com forward slash give and you can choose where your finance goes. All that's left to say is take care, God bless and have a great week. Hopefully we'll see you soon.